the previous panel very kindly said uh, many journalists are uh, in-depth thinkers and able to research. I'm not one of them. I'm a generalist, uh, but it's very kind of uh, ORF to put me on a session which is essentially a technical session, but what we're trying to do is break it down for you. Uh, in between the paranoia that we see uh, with every passing election around the world, uh, and between the opaque states that are running a lot of these programs, there is a lot of room for information, for an understanding of just what the new cyberscape means, uh, and what kind of challenges it is throwing for each one of us. Uh, certainly, um, this session is looking in particular to look at the role of the intermediary. Somewhere there is that sacred bond, supposedly, between the state and uh, the average user, the average citizen. Uh, also seeing the role of an intermediary. The intermediary could be, as we have seen, uh, small uh, internet entities. It could more likely be, as we are seeing, a growing presence of large corporate entities in this space. Uh, today, the fact is, whether we like it or not, each of us have on our phones handed over a certain amount of information we probably don't even share with family members uh, to Google or to Facebook or uh, to, to one of the other uh, very popular, what we're calling intermediary entities here. So what I'd like to do without much further ado is um, ask our panelists to A, uh, put out what one of our former national security advisors called uh, a couple of days ago the new playground for non-state actors. Uh, and, and A, put out a little bit of a map of what are we looking at, what are the kind of threats, what are the kind of challenges. Obviously, terror is only one of them. Uh, and uh, um, and uh, you know, election rigging is also only one of them. Uh, but what are the other threats we're talking about? And if it is the case, that say a corporate entity today can control a lot of this intermediary space to the point at which the government start you know, uh, needing to worry, then how far are we going to be able to go with government to government cooperation? And I'm speaking very specifically about countries today that are looking to merge their databases, that are looking to cooperate on absolutely every kind of vital information, uh, secure, uh, national security information and all the rest of that. Uh, personal identity information, uh, you know, how far should we immunize ourselves from such global partnerships if they are actually not 100% foolproof and certainly not 100% safe from entities which if they are working on the profit motive are actually also um, uh, vulnerable uh, for just that profit. Uh, so I'm putting out a lot of provocative ideas here, and I hope that uh, our panelists will, uh, will, will come up with their solutions and their idea of where the threat uh, really lies. Um, I'm very uh, grateful to be joined by Udbhav Tiwari. He's the policy officer of the Center for Internet and Society. One of the perks always of doing any kind of a session on cyber is you always get the younger participants. Um, and uh, uh, we also have uh, Nalin Suri, Director General of the ICWA, uh, which has under his Director Generalship taken on a much younger and thought, more thoughtful uh, sort of look at some of the modern challenges uh, that our diplomacy is facing. So I hope you will speak a little bit about where diplomacy comes into all of this. Uh, Mr. Uh, Subramanian Chandrasekhar couldn't join us today. Uh, who, he is the Group Director of, uh, gov of micro at Microsoft India. So we are very pleased that Mr. Hugo Trambali, who's the Scientific Advisor and Head of the India Program at the Italian Institute for International Political Studies, I ISPI, has agreed to speak to us amongst so many other things uh, where he is qualified to speak to us. Uh, he has also spent a considerable time in Moscow. Um, and uh, we would be grateful if you'd put a little bit of uh, light on something that we just we hear about, you know, whether uh, amongst others, <laughs> um, and uh, uh, and and also, of course, I shouldn't uh, welcome Arun Sukumar. Of course, he is from ORF, but he's the head of the Cyber Policy Initiative and somebody uh, we follow his writing very closely on the subject. Um, Mr. Tiwari, if I could start with you, and uh, we'll try and move the 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 conversation along as quickly as possible so that we can get to your questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, ma'am, and thank you to all the organizers for giving me this opportunity to be able to speak to all of you. 
Um, so as you can see from the title of the session, it's it's about the comparison of what is now the new Cold War, right? So what I'm largely going to do is first sort of map out what I think are the main stakeholders in these new Cold Wars, which aren't necessarily nation states. And then after that, I'm going to primarily talk about three points. Firstly, I'm going to talk about the notion of state sovereignty and how state sovereignty has now morphed into this new entity that doesn't really follow its boundary, the boundaries of physical space anymore, especially when it comes to technology. And then I'm going to talk about the role of tech giants and how they can be conduits, tools, as well as victims in uh, the modern global scenario. And finally, I'm going to then talk about terrorism, how technology is playing a role in both aiding and abetting terrorism, and then look at solutions of how we can solve some of the biggest problems that are currently facing the global order. Right, so now starting off with who the main stakeholders in this conversation are, right? I mean, personally at CIS, we largely look at them as four stakeholders. Firstly, we look at nation states. Secondly, non-stake actors. Thirdly, corporations. And fourthly, and what we personally consider the most important as citizens, right? Now, we believe that the traditional notions of what a war is or who a war could be fought between right up to the Second World War was largely governed by nation states. We had the League of Nations, at the end of the Second World War, we had the United Nations, and there was a clear understanding that when wars were fought, if they were external, they would necessarily be between nation states. In the modern context, however, especially aided by the rise of technology, that has rapidly changed. Right? Non-state actors, whether it be Al-Qaeda operating out of Afghanistan, or whether it be anonymous operating out of God knows how many countries in the world, actions that are being taken in the name of nationalism or in the name of furthering state interest are not necessarily being carried out by state interests anymore. A lot of these actions are being carried out by people who believe that whether you look at the India-Pakistan cyber wars that regularly keep happening with government websites being defaced, or whether you look at more serious allegations like the Sony hack that was allegedly, allegedly carried out by North Korea, it's becoming very clear that states are learning to exploit this gray area between official actors of a state, as well as individuals who can act in the state's interest, but not necessarily in a manner that would further the interest of the state if it were to come out in the public domain. Right? Now, the last two uh, characterizations, which are corporations and citizens, are of key importance here. One, because it is more often than not that these corporations who play the role of intermediaries, right? And as I stated, they can be conduits, victims, as well as tools in any cyber war. And I'm going to come to that in greater detail when I talk about corporations. But the, probably the most important stakeholder in this entire scenario are the citizens of the world, right? Whether you're a citizen of a country or whether you're a citizen of a regional uh, organization like the European Union, the actions that regularly take place in cyberspace, whether they be an attack that takes down the internet for your locality for a couple of days, or whether it's millions of usernames or passwords that are leaked onto the internet and therefore your privacy is compromised, it is more often than not that citizens who face the greatest brunt of these actions. And a lot of my solutions are going to look at how citizens can be protected from what is necessarily a war that is being fought by a minuscule percentage of their own population, aka the people who have the technical skill and ability to fight this war, but is something that affects all of them at a very large scale. Now coming to the notion of state sovereignty. State sovereignty is necessarily a concept that has been a part of the world order for millennia. It is the basis for traditional interactions between state parties, where ever since at least post the United Nations, there is an understanding that we are all equal, that what is ours is ours, and even though what is ours may be disputed, once it is established that something is a state's, it is something that should not be interfered with. Now this notion of sovereignty is traditionally always based in physical characteristics, boundaries, or ownership. However, internet, or the network at large, is something that doesn't really follow these boundaries anymore. Be the very nature of the internet n makes it an entity that transmits information across borders just the same way it would transmit information within those borders, right? And this is something that has started to become a problem. The entire international order has, built has been built on the notion of sovereignty of being able to assign actions that occur to certain parties and certain entities. With cyberspace, this becomes a very, very big problem. And in fact, it can be used as a tool by the individuals who utilize cyberspace to, say, carry out a cyber attack in order to get away with responsibility for a particular action. But to give you a small example, both the DNC hack, which is now being attributed to Russia, and the Sony hack, which was attributed to North Korea, are both acts that took months of investigations to finally narrow down. And the uh, evidence that was finally even submitted to courts 
was evidence that took a lot of like millions of dollars of effort and some of the most targeted surveillance that was carried out in modern times in order to actually arrive at the conclusion that these are the states from which it began. Right now, if you're fighting a cold war, the first thing you really need to know is who your enemy is or who is your attacker. And if a state has the ability to make it look like another state is an attacker, right? And this is not as simple as dressing up soldiers and leaving them on the, bo on the border of Poland and starting the Second World War. This is me knocking out your electrical, say, infrastructure for months at an end using targeted attacks from a neighbor with which you have sensitive relations that can escalate into a global real conflict. Right? Now, these notions are something that the international order has not really learned to account for in the traditional notions of what is international law because of the strong basis that it has on space, right? of ownership on um, physical entities which digital providers don't really comply with. Now, what is the most common way in which this sort of ephemeral notion of space is exploited? Normally in the form of intermediaries who are the entities which make up the internet. The problem with the internet is that you cannot point at one or say hundred or even thousand entities and say that this is the internet. The only way you can really talk about the internet is that it's an amalgamation of people that offer the service of connecting with each other. I mean, and even that is a really, really broad and possibly vague definition, right? Which necessarily means that the nature of the internet, internet has always been content neutral. Right? Intelligence on a pipe, when it comes to the internet, is always available at the end of the pipe, never when the pipe itself is carrying that information. Right? Now, whether this pipe be a connection between two countries, or whether this pipe is a connection between my computer and the server located in the room next to me, by its nature, the internet is supposed to be an entity that does not regulate content when it is transiting, and only regulates content when it finally reaches where it is supposed to. How can this be a problem? DDoS or distributed denial of service attacks are attacks that are normally carried out which when millions of computers are exploited and made to send malicious DNS requests to certain targeted IP addresses. Now, one would think that it would be possible for a computer to not send out these requests or before these requests reach their final destination, somebody who operates the pipe in between would understand that these requests are malicious and therefore not, not allow them to pass. But the internet, because of its very nature, simply does not allow this to happen. Now, if you're a nation like China that operates the Great Firewall and that says that we will regulate the sort of content that both enters and leaves our country, there are more avenues that are available to you for, for you to regulate this content, and there are both pros and cons of this. However, most of the internet does not follow this model. Most of the internet is necessarily by its nature an open-ended space that does not have place for regulation when it is in transit. This very nature of the internet, the fact that it can be ephemeral, is what is largely exploited by attackers. In the example of the, apart from the example of the DDoS attack, any sensible hacker would tell you that if you have to run an uh, attack even on a single computer in a locality, you would always necessarily route it through a VPN. Now, if you were to route this, like routing an attack through a VPN may sound like a lot of acronyms and just technical mumbo jumbo, but what it essentially does is it makes it look like it is happening from some other place. And now when you start thinking that attacks happen from some other place, you necessarily start investigating from that point. In fact, this very nature of the internet in networks like Tor is exploited in order to provide anonymity to child pornographers and human rights activists alike. Right? So it's very hard for us to say that the fact that the internet is an open-ended or neutral space is a problematic thing. It, it is a thing that does lead to some problems, but it definitely also has a lot of benefits. Now the corporations that normally provide this transit or provide the services on this medium tend to be large corporations, which, as I stated earlier, tend to be tools, victims, as well as convicts of the information. They tend to be convicts because more often than not, they do not really care what you store in their in, on their websites, right? While storing child pornography may be a crime, Google is not going to automatically delete your account if you store child pornography on your Gmail account. Similarly, if you carry out conversations on, say, a secure, a supposedly secure medium like WhatsApp about carrying out a terrorist attack, it's not WhatsApp's business and will not automatically shut your account down. This content agnostic nature of the services that are provided by the internet more often than not makes them blind conduits to almost everything that happens within them. Now, this is independent of the legal relationship that this intermediary shares with that nation state. Even if a nation state says these 20 things are crimes, and you cannot allow them to take place on your mediums, 
short of breaching this neutral nature of the internet and starting to monitor and regulate content that is being stored on your services on an active basis which increases by petabytes every day there is no real solution for you but to allow that to happen anyway in case you are detected and if a law enforcement does put in a request or somebody by a community monitoring says that there is illegal content available on this medium yes then there are measures available but a vast amount of this content simply goes undetected and causes the harm that it is supposed to come cause second is that these intermediaries also tend to be victims they tend to be victims because they are often prime targets for state hackers right let's just take some, I, what i would say are the three biggest um, one of the among the three biggest entities on the internet in terms of mass public use google facebook and twitter all of these services currently give you a warning if they suspect that if you are a victim of a state sponsored attack right they say that because they understand that there are certain states that target accounts either from citizens of your own state or from accounts of citizens from states who they want to target that you may be a victim of a state sponsored attack the fact that these entities have the ability to like find out that this can take place and inform their citizens just shows just how open like just how pervasive such attacks have necessarily become even if you look at wanna cry right the recent hacker attack that essentially exploited a vulnerability in microsoft samba infrastructure that was then utilized by nsa for many years before it was released by shadow brokers um, uh, operating systems by their very nature tend to be complex entities that are made up of billions of lines of code you cannot ever make sure that an operating system is completely secure right and the fact that certain companies create these tools and services it it essentially becomes incredibly important for us to make sure that the liability for such actions is only given to certain is is only given after due investigation and companies are not placed under like under the nose just because of the fact that they developed the software in the first place so quickly within a minute just wrapping up what i think are the solutions for handling this problem is that cooperation between nation states and creating a rule of law based framework for the internet are the only is is probably going to be the first step to solving this problem the traditional laws and regulations both national and international simply aren't designed to deal with the informal nature of what is cyberspace what certain things that such a law whether it be in the form of a treaty or whether it be in the form of another form of regional cooperation are one a treaty that governs the actions and clearly defines what is right or wrong between state parties which currently does not exist secondly a treaty that establishes cooperation and trust between nations including how they would necessarily interact with each other if something goes wrong examples from um, the space of nuclear technology as well as outer space shows that nations are fairly good at learning how to implement specialized treaties that deal with certain things right so if we can have an iaea say for nuclear inspections why can we not have a un mandated organization that investigates cyber attack if they occur between nation states without regard to what their without regard to national interests and finally and what i personally think is the most important measure is that while states may carry out attacks more often than not they are targeted towards citizens ensuring that citizens are well aware educated and are informed about what the risks in cybersecurity are what best practices for using technology on a day to day basis are and are provided means of redress within the national jurisdictions if something goes wrong is the best way to ensure that the harm that can occur to citizens when it comes to cyber attacks is minimized along with international cooperation thank you thanks so much uh, mr tiwari and and to be honest you've put a lot of uh, uh, information out there which i hope all our participants can uh, build on very interestingly you speak about this treaty on state parties i'm not sure uh, nuclear technology which tends to be a little technical can be put on uh, you know put on the same basis as a treaty on cyber crimes because of course crimes are different in different countries uh, you know what might be a crime uh, for for uh, someone to pass on on a social media group say in turkey may not be something that is shared by sweden um and similarly so i mean given uh, the quagmire of uniform criminal codes uh, uh, everywhere i i think uh, uh, maybe that is something we should come to but it comes Uh, very directly to you ambassador suri to take this forward because a lot of uh, what we are discussing here today really involves how diplomats are able to uh, make sense of a a whole new field and b the traditional um, hesitations if you like 
of countries when it comes to issues like privacy, when it comes to issues like national security. Thank you, Swashni, and I think uh, you're right. I will focus on the uh, foreign policy aspects of this, but funnily enough, I'm going to really compliment what Udhav said, because I think we're basically all on the same page. Uh, three thoughts arise in my mind from the content proposed for this session. First, how digital networks affect the traditional role of the state in securing its borders. Second, content providers and disseminators coming under the political scanner. And finally, cooperation to tackle terrorism in this fast-growing digital era. These are huge subjects which are of enormous contemporary importance. The signs of the digital world being misused are all around us. Their scope for misuse seems unlimited. In his article entitled The Paradox of Power in the Network Age, written by David Rothkopf in Foreign Policy of October 2015, the author wrote about, and I quote, the net's ability to swiftly transfer power from node to node or to enable ad hoc alliances to emerge quickly as actors seek strength through collaboration, unquote. He goes on to write, and I quote again, contradictions are themselves an essential aspect of this new era and should inform us as we seek to, command, seek to command a virtual landscape, one that we have made but whose form keeps shifting and whose horizons we cannot see. Permit me now to make seven points which may be germane to our discussion and will actually complement much of what Udhav just said. <coughs> First, digital networks are fast replacing traditional written and electronic media. The mobile phone and, and its potential new incarnations are now probably the most effective medium for disseminating and receiving news be it fake news, half-truths, opinions, or simply facts, and responding to an audience that is virtually unlimited in size. Hence the demand, more often than not, for instant responses or comments to set the record right or to communicate an alternative thought process. And you can imagine how difficult this makes diplomacy these days. Second, the media has traditionally played an important role in foreign policy formulation and the analysis of international events be they political, economic, military, or strategic. It has been a major source of information for foreign policy planners. It seriously impacts on any government's ability to secure its borders, especially where borders are contested. Besides, even where borders are settled, non-traditional security threats have demonstrated their utter disregard for the sanctity of such borders. The role of the media in maintaining domestic peace and stability is no less important. Indeed, in the fast-growing digital world, the role of the media, to my mind, has become even more critical. Third, technology giants that today dominate digital networks are not intrinsically inimical to the desire of any state to protect its sovereignty, borders, and interests. They are aware that terrorists, drug peddlers, human smugglers, promoters of child prostitution, and other purveyors of evil need to be stopped. But, often on account of bottom-line considerations, legal provisions, and the dynamics of evolving technology and hacking, these evil forces are not being contained. This is clearly not acceptable, and hence the need for a new social contract. And this is where I disagree slightly from what Uta said. I think it's more than laws that we need. We need a new social contract among governments, business, civil society, technology providers, and the courts to ensure that the forces of terrorism and other forms of evil and unacceptable behavior are prevented to the extent technologically feasible from using digital networks. At the very least, they must be seriously constrained. Technology is constantly evolving, and those that are bent on misusing it are tech savvy. This contract will thus have to be one that can automatically take on board the fast pace of change. Any such contract cannot, at the same time, be allowed to impede or obstruct the forces of democratic pluralism and the exercise of fundamental freedoms and human rights. Fourth, technology tech giants have also to bear in mind that in many cases the state has an alternative to replace their technology and systems. A clear example is that of China, which is independently developing its digital networks and denying access to the traditional ones. I was in China a few days ago and could not access my Google account. There are other IT superpowers such as Russia, Japan, Germany, Israel, and ROK, which can provide stiff competition as states to the traditional technology giants. So too, perhaps, can India at some point in time. Fifth, there are legitimate issues of privacy involved. This you mentioned, Sajni. Not to mention intelligence gathering by states and commercial organizations. Given the current nature of statecraft and economic espionage, this is not something which can or will stop very easily. In many democratic countries, the courts are becoming arbiters of what constitutes 
a legitimate violation of privacy or whether intelligence gathering is consistent with constitutional rights. This process has only started and its future direction is still not clear. There is, however, need to evolve an early international consensus on guidelines guaranteeing privacy and intellectual property rights versus the need for ensuring security and greater access to technological process. Sixth, many multinational businesses today are larger than many national economies. They run complicated transnational production and communication systems. They are developers of technology and knowledge-based products. New technological developments are putting traditional economics on its head, and economists and social planners are looking for new ideas to respond to these challenges so as to ensure a fulfilling and productive work life for citizens all over the world. The alternative is even greater social alienation than at present with all its attendant downsides. Business thus has to be a part of the solution and not part of the problem. Finally, I believe that the word Cold War is much abused today. I do not believe that we are in the midst of a new Cold War as the topic of this session would suggest. The challenge of information and cyber technologies being misused is one that the international community must jointly address. At the same time, it has to be borne in mind that states have always used technological advance to further their domestic and international interests. This is also true of business. This will not give change given the present structure of international and governance and also international commercial practice. But digital networks by, this, by their very nature cannot be circumscribed beyond a point. Even in China, there are ways in which you can go around firewalls erected to ban sites. The world will have to change with the extremely rapid technological advances taking place across a huge swathe of disciplines and activities. The international community must harness this change for the betterment of society all over the world and not simply to pursue not narrow national interests. Terrorists and other purveyors of violence and evil must not be allowed to benefit from these technological advances. This will require, as I said earlier, very close collaboration among governments, business, and civil society networks. In the interim, states will have no option but to devise ways and means to defend their borders, citizens, economies, and societies. And these measures will seldom be optimal. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ambassador Suri, for keeping it also uh, so concisely put so we understand. I, I, I don't know if we have time apart from diplomacy to also speak a little bit about warfare, but uh, maybe that's for another day, particularly when we're looking at things like uh, drone technology. Um, Mr. Trambali, uh, I'll allow you to take over from here and give us as much of the international context to this as possible. Well, <coughs> thank you. As a weapon of last resort, uh, I, mean, I didn't have the time to prepare my intervention, <laughs> and, and and I usually I used to stimulate the other to talk rather than to be stimulated to talk because in the last in these last 37 years I was a journalist. Uh, Jim, you're right. Um, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a immigrant here, and exactly among you, I'm, uh, my position is the one of uh, of uh, the professional refugee. Uh, but I'm glad to be here. To be here. Uh, I'm not very expert on, of, of cyber war because I'm a, at the end of the day I'm a 20th century journalist. But uh, I'm, I'm against my will. I'm an I'm expert of wars. And amazing, amazingly, but not surprisingly, I, I was covering much more war uh, after the collapse of the Berlin Wall rather than before, as uh, we were supposed to, to follow. Um, and I was. Uh, Middle East correspondent, war correspondent, uh, uh, and uh, my first assignment in, uh, in India was uh, the Indira assassination and Bhopal tragedy, and young guys in this room fasten your, your seatbelts. And I send my story with a telex. I don't know you don't know what a telex is, but anyway. Uh, and last but not least, I was Moscow correspondent. Um, so again, I'm not expert on cyber, but expert on Russia. And since the Russia or Soviet <laughs> Union is the, 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 the how could I say, the, the main character of the of cyber use, of political use of cyber, I, I, have, I have some expertise on that. Um, I have to argue about the title of this, of this meeting, the, the new Cold War. I don't think this is going to be what we are going to see between Russia and Western world and et cetera. 
a real Cold War. It's something totally different, maybe a Cold War with us or something like that. Because at that time, Soviet Union used to be a contender. They, they used to propose um, a policy, an economy, a social policies, totally different than ours, and in competition. Then we, we discovered afterward that this was a, 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 a Potionkin village, but we believe on that. Today, Russia is something different. Today, Russia is not a modern superpower. If I am a, a 20th century journalist, uh, so Russia is a, is a 20th century empire or uh, superpower, or I would say a 19th century superpower. Um, the big expertise used to be nuclear uh, arsenals and disinformation. That was for Soviet Union and it's also for Russia. I don't see any other reason to, to consider Russia a, a modern superpower. China, um, if they want to be a superpower, they invented uh, over. Russia, because it wanted to be a superpower, a geopolitical superpower without uh, soft power, without any sexy reason to be followed, uh, decided to get into with the trumpets and drums to get into Middle East, in the culture of the Middle East, from where we Europeans and the Americans are trying to get out. Uh, Russia produces uh, weapons and energy, which is not, not few, but they don't have any, any kind of a manufacturing industry. Um, the 70% the, the of, the, of, the, of the, in 2015, 70% of the GD, Russian GDP was uh, made by state and, and state-owned co companies. The big difference together with, the, to, to, with other things is that the um, Soviet Union used to be uh, a state socialist. Russia is a state capitalist, but I want to stress state. The big used to be the big bro brother and is still the big brother of the state. So, but again, Russia is the, uh, the big, we got a big expertise on, uh, on, uh, on disinformation that you, we used to be, in the last century, we, we used to call it disinformation. Now we call it uh, um, um, cyber war. Uh, but it's the same at the end of the day. They are very good on this. They were able to, to get into the American, the system of the American election, which is outstanding because K KGB was never, for 50 years, was never ever able to do something like, that, like this. But they are able to do this. And uh, they were able to transform personality like a person like, uh, like Julian Assange, Assange in a hero. Assange is not a hero, he's a, maybe he's a KGB agent. Could you imagine? He was able to leak the American secrets, which is good. <laughs> we always need to, to discover, especially now, to discover the American secrets. But no secrets, not leaked from, so, from Russia. Sorry, it's a, it's a Freudian mistake. I, always, I, I continue to call them Soviet Union, but it's not Soviet, it's Soviet, it's Etarasia, which is the same of, um, of Peter the Great. Or Stalin, there is not a very huge difference. Mm, I mean, I was missing my point criticizing Russia. <laughs> and the, and it's, it's crazy because Russia doesn't have any, any capability to, to produce, uh, to produce a, 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 a sexy reason to, to, to follow Russia. Who would like to, who have in the world would like to prefer rather than the European Union? Uh, the, the economic, uh, Russian economic sphere with, uh, uh, if I well remember, Armenia, Kazakhstan, and uh, not Moldova, but just a, a, a small part of Moldova. Of course, they, of course not, but nevertheless, a large amount of European are, are, are with, uh, mm, they follow and they, they believe in, uh, in the reason of, uh, of uh, Vladimir Vladimirovich, which is Putin. Um, in Europe, in Italy, there is a, a, lot, the public, a, a large amount of public opinion is against uh, the, um, the, uh, the, the, the sanction, the economic sanction we are making. And we European, we understand totally the, 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 the position, the opinion of, uh, of, uh, of Russia about Crimea. We, we understand the historical reason to, to possess Crimea, but they were able, the, the disinformation, or if you want to call it cyber war or, or Russia, they were able to transform uh, um, an occupation, a military occupation. Last time in Europe was, I believe, was uh, was France, 
1940, after the, the, the Troll Guerre. So after, after Hitler, no one changed the, 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 the framework of European stability invading military and uh, an European space. But nevertheless, it's, uh, a, a, a larger part, a, a, for instance, in Italy, a huge amount of, uh, of Italians are much more pro, pro, pro Putin than they used to be pro America. No, I'm not saying the American today, I used to be, let's say, the previous administration. Uh, it's too easy now to be anti American today. Uh, <laughs> but um, it's too much. It's um, but uh, but with Russia we have to deal. Last year during the election, uh, I mean, the, well, when it was a, it was a nightmare. I was walking between 14th Street and uh, and, uh, and Massachusetts Avenue, uh, November 8, like a ghost, uh, with a lot of lot of other people from Carnegie, <laughs> um, um, Brookings, who were walking in the night. We didn't know, couldn't understand. I remember I got a meeting with Leo Panetta, you know, former head of. Uh, Secretary of Defense and uh, and uh, head of CIA. He said, "Of course, we have to deal with uh, with Russia. Well, of course, we have to talk with Russia, uh, but we have to talk from a position of strength. Otherwise, the Russians they, they wouldn't be able to understand our position, and they would believe that we are we are weak. We are, we are weak. And this was the point of uh, of the cyber war. And I'm concluding. And the point of cyber war is that." We can call it cyber, but at the end of the day, is again, is war. Is war to reach position? Is war uh, to reach, uh, to, to conquer geopolitics, uh, geopolitical uh, position, and to and to change uh, also our own system? Uh, in Europe, we have been, and I, I'm, I'm afraid in Italy next year for for sure we will have election because we are able to change prime minister every nine months, but we have election only at five years only every five years, and I'm afraid that they will able, to, the cyber or ancient war of uh, this informatia from Russia, they will be able to, to, to try to force, uh, to change, to, 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 to deal with the, the Italian election, as they try to do with the French, uh, with Dutch, uh, with Brexit, and with the American election. So we have to be careful. Let's call it, if you want, uh, cyber war, but at the end of the day, I repeat, it's war. Thanks so much for a delightful uh, presentation uh, at such short no notice. Um, and I wonder how we could uh, take a lot of this forward. But one of the questions that keeps coming back uh, to me is how is it that all the world's most sophisticated countries, uh, with all this, uh, you know, as, as soon as you know you're going to have an election, you pretty much know <laughs> that you're going to expect that there may be a threat from Russia. I just uh, was this month in Germany. Uh, and already ahead of the October elections, you know, there are so many uh, places where they are talking about what kind of threats may, may come from there, and yet uh, they are not able to stop them. Uh, but, I mean, there are more serious threats, uh, I, and I think uh, that's where people want to know where this can lead, and it's not just Russia. As Bob pointed out, there are attacks from North Korea. Uh, Russia itself is supposed to have now the technology, according to the Washington Post, to take down power um, uh, services in various cities around the world. Um, we know Stuxnet was able to do as much as it was able to do in 2013. Um, you know, we've seen Russia supposedly take out a USS ship, the Donald Cook in the Black Sea in 2014. Um, Estonia, Stockholm, these are all very, very sophisticated countries that are dealing with this. Uh, so can I leave the job of even putting together a lot of what everyone else has spoken about uh, uh, to you, Arun, because I want to take as many questions as possible. Um, in fact, Swasni, perhaps I can uh, take off where you left for a quick straw poll among the, the folks in this room, and I hope the lunch does not stop you from this response. Um, how many folks here believe that your political differences, your political views aside, that the Russian hacking of the US presidential elections was illegal. How many people believe that the Russian hacking of elections was in, in fact illegal? Legal. Illegal. Illegal. Well, that's pretty much everybody in the room then. That's only the number of drinks we have to 
But I, I mean, I'm sorry to disappoint you as a lawyer, but the number of laws, the number of international laws that Russia violated while hacking the U.S. presidential election was zero. And the reason why that is the case, because there is no standard operating procedure currently for what constitutes a lawful or an unlawful act, uh, whether it is a cyber attack or whether it is an information war. Um, espionage certainly is not, is, is not violative of international law, and most people argue that what Rus Russians did at a much allegedly did at a much sophisticated level was basically leak information, which is basically the, the theme of what I'm going to discuss, that all cyber wars today are information wars. There is no war that is targeting a cyber or a digital infrastructure, but the most lucrative destination or the lu most lucrative target for these so-called cyber attacks are information. Um, and um, Suhasni be began this uh, presentation by saying that we should really consider immunizing ourselves from certain information sharing or uh, you know global agreements so that a turkey does not get information that is hosted from a sweden because an allegedly autocratic country should not get access to information that is stored in a country that no, no, has I, a the, the turkey sweden was about them having different uh, laws. laws so one will censor something or china will censor right. something so those were so uh, on that point of having different laws in 2013 for the uninitiated especially for our guests from outside india uh, there was a communal riot that broke out in the state of uttar pradesh in 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 a in a municipality called muzaffarnagar and the violence was perpetrated almost uh, or incited almost exclusively through social media, through platforms uh, like WhatsApp and Twitter. And I think we can mostly agree that India continues to be a democracy with a rule of law. And when the officer in charge of this investigation from an institution no less than the National Investigative Agency um, wrote to the US, uh, to, wrote, wrote to his or her US counterpart, um, presumably in the Federal Bureau of Investigation, requesting help identifying who the perpetrators of, who the inciters of violence were in Musafar Nagar, because these, uh, these perpetrators had used US-based social media platforms. Uh, I'm told that the US investigator said that the First Amendment to the United States basically prohibits um, uh, us from providing information to India. And this is an example where there is clearly a distinction between the two laws, although both are constitutional democracies, it's just that the United States definition of what constitutes hate speech or free speech and the, and the restrictions or the exceptions to free speech are just not the way in which we define free speech. As a result of this, again, lack of a standard operating procedure, countries have begun to value information more than they should. Um, so, you know, again, leading me to the conclusion that all cyber wars today are about information. And I'll just conclude by pointing out to the major cyber attacks that have happened, some of which have already been listed by Suhasini, and point out that these are not cyber attacks. These are, these are information wars, beginning with the Sony attack, uh, the North Korean attack on Sony in 2014. After the, the hacking of uh, uh, Sony Entertainment, uh, Sony Pictures in 2014, the company issued a press release stating that the, the overall damages that they sustained as a result of the cyber attack was roughly in the area between 10 and 15 million dollars. The value that they paid, or the money that they paid to Amy Pascal, who resigned as a result of the leaks that came from the North Korean attacks, was roughly 5 million a year. Sony paid 5 million a year to Amy Pascal, who had to resign as a result of the information leaks. Whereas the damage that they incurred was rough, you know, two times that amount. The attack presumably targeted information more than the infrastructure of Sony. Because here they found somebody who uh, was a convenient scapegoat and for Sony presumably an irreplaceable and a highly talented officer. The TV5 attack um, uh, in 2014, um, ISIS or Russia, the jury is out on who exactly did it, attacked the French TV channel um, TV5 Monday. And for a, for a good three hours, the entire channel infrastructure, including its social media, uh, Twitter handles and Facebook pages and so on and so forth, were down. For TV5 to recover from that attack, like I said, it took basically three hours. There was a very uh, alert chap who was managing the back-end operations of TV5 on that particular day, and he was able to um, resuscitate the channel, so to say. But the information that was leaked after the attack, which is that TV5 and generally French channels are insecure or unsafe uh, in the aftermath of a uh, cyber attack, led the French government to start thinking about a very draconian 
regulation on the media. So immediately after the cyber attack, the cyber attack, uh, the French government convened a gathering of of uh, prominent media channels to discuss in what cases information should be shared and what cases information should not be shared. Basically, the beginnings of a of a surveillance state in France. The third cyber attack is with regard to the one um, conducted allegedly by Iran in 2012 on the Saudi oil company Aramco. Again, thanks to the uh, the alertness of the folks who were involved in managing the back-end operations of Aramco, which uh, is one of the biggest oil uh, companies in the world, uh, the cyber attack itself did not have any major consequence to the infrastructure of the Saudi company. But the information that was uh, circulated as in the aftermath of this attack, that here is a company that controls 10% of the world's oil production directly or indirectly, led to a dramatic dipping of oil prices. That was brief, I mean, it's another fact that oil prices bounce, but it led to a dramatic in a decrease in uh, the price of oil immediately after the cyber attack. And presumably the folks from Iran or wherever uh, the attacks originated from was not targeting the, the infrastructure from Aramco because they would have good reasons to believe that this is a critical infrastructure of Saudi Arabia, this is extremely well protected, but what we want to target is the information that this is a company that sits on 10% of the world's, the world's uh, oil production. And the last uh, attack is of course the, the one on the, the, the not so illegal attack or the, um, the hacking of the US presidential election by Russia. Um, presumably there weren't a lot of costs incurred for the Democratic National Committee to recover its, um, uh, its damaged infrastructure or to put its servers back online is, um, is, is, is not a lot for a, for a political party that has the wherewithal um, and the resources that the DNC had. But the information that was leaked which is basically that the Hillary Clinton campaign was aloof and all the narratives that were spread, some would say directly led to the, to the election of, uh, of a Donald Trump. And the costs of that election, we will find out soon enough, at least in Delhi, <laughs> may perhaps be um, priceless. <laughs> Thank you. Mm. Uh, the question being, and I think we asked this. No, just a quick, uh, when will we find out in New Delhi? On the 26th. <laughs> <laughs> Straight after. <laughs> directly from the White House. Um, uh, you know, the, the, the question really being, uh, do we make too much of uh, these events or, or is there really a threat uh, to deal with? I'll tell you one more threat that uh, we didn't speak about is the domestic uh, desire to, to keep a certain uh, narrative out of the public domain. Uh, so last, last year, earlier this year, um, at a public function we heard from a senior official uh, who's involved in cybersecurity, uh, countering one of the points we were making, because right now, you know, we're all talking about digital India and how this is going to take India into the uh, next century and a new uh, orbit altogether. Um, and, uh, and the official sort of as a counter to what people were asking him about, and some of those things Udbhav mentioned and Arun mentioned as well, uh, where there has been hacking, um, uh, you know, and said, well, you don't even know that we had a hacking of $170 million last year from one bank account, and we were able to get that back in exactly one week. Um, so it took a little bit of digging, and we were able to find that, in fact, that money had come back, but that it had made it to four different countries by that point. Uh, and it is a very frightening idea that these things are happening, but we're not really talking about them. Secondly, we're not talking even now, despite having unearthed this, uh, we're still not talking about, for example, um, what are the international linkages? Were they linked to the group behind uh, the Sony hacking? Is the Lazarus group something uh, that, that we know enough about to say it's not? I, I, I mean, uh, it's, a, it's a bad comparison to make, but in the year 2001, uh, there was a certain hesitation in India to allow that Al-Qaeda had any kind of link to any operations in India. Uh, today, there's a similar uh, hesitation in trying to find out if there are uh, these linkages to big, bigger countries, bigger companies, uh, and bigger networks that are getting at us. Um, so that's just my personal experience here. Uh, I would like to know how many questions there are in the audience, and we'll time ourselves accordingly. Okay, I see at least two, three, four, five, six. Uh, Samir, you'll go last. Okay. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm, 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 I can do it while wrapping up in the next. Uh, All right. So I can see Dr. Latharedi had put up her hand. Joseph over here, the gentleman there, uh, and you there in that order. Would you like to start? Sure. Uh, thank you, Suhasini. I was very intrigued, you know, because we talked about 
the new Cold War, and uh, I agree with uh, Nalan, I don't think there's a really a Cold War. Also, the subtitle of your session is in Information and Cyber War. But if you actually look at the substance of what you said, you've talked about three main issues. Has information technology affected the traditional roles of states and their borders? The role of technology giants as intermediaries between the state and the citizen. And thirdly, government and businesses tackling terrorism in cyberspace together. Um, and, you know, you made a, someone made a suggestion, I think it was you, Udnaf, who said that we should have something like the IAEA or like the nuclear or space agreements. I think the problem is that previous efforts to try to re reach some kind of interstate or international or multilateral, whatever you want to call it, consensus through now it's five UNGGs summit, do you remember? Five. <coughs> the fifth UNGG has just <coughs> concluded. The difficulty is there's a lot of agreement on norms, but there's great hesitation in making them into binding norms, which would then lead to actual treaties being signed and then, so there's a kind of a thing of let's all have a code of conduct, let's all uh, agree to some kind of general behavior, but not to actually legislating and creating. And I think there'd be great opposition to setting up a UN-led uh, organization to monitor cyberspace, because there's a great worry that it will affect the open and innovative character of the internet, as you know very well. The question of government and businesses working together, I have a little experience in that because I started the first joint working group in India uh, between the government and the private sector to talk about cyber issues. One of the issues we certainly spoke about was cybersecurity, and the amazing thing was there was a lot of similarity of thinking. The question was how would it actually be executed? Because the businesses were of the opinion that they could provide the expertise, the, the personnel, but the government had to provide the funding. And perhaps to a certain extent that was a valid expectation, but as far as I know, that has not really progressed. I think when there is cooperation, it would be more in the nature of outsourcing for a very specific project and possibly highly confidential agreements that may never see the light of day because it's not going to be an out there agreement between a government and a private company. Uh, the uh, role of technical giants as intermediaries, I'm not really sure, you know, I think I don't think they become intermediaries. I think citizens object to their rights to express themselves on these platforms built by the technology giants, but I don't see them acting as intermediaries. I think the government will have a certain equation with them, the citizen will have a certain equation and expectation from them. So it's more of a, a comment, not a question, but uh, that's what I want. But a very important one given your own experience. Yeah. In government as well. Uh, just you have a question. Yeah, I had a, a comment and a question on the uh, intrusion of the DNC and the Russian involvement in that. So obviously, you're you're going after the international law aspect of the activity, and you're saying there's no violation. But of course, there was violation of uh, U.S. domestic law, and those people who did that would be uh, subject to justice in the United States. And we have many Russians already in jail in the U.S. for hacking into. Uh, American uh, corporate uh, servers and stealing money and all the rest. We, we, and we have names on those who conducted the, uh, the attacks on the DNC. And so those people would have to be uh, weary of traveling to the US or even to uh, Interpol countries where we could uh, have red notices out there to have them arrested and extradited to the United States. So <clears throat> I think you're being a little cute there by saying there's no violation of law because there was violation of law. It was just not international law because, as you rightly observed, we don't have international treaty or something that governs that. So I think to be more specific, there was no violation of international law, but there was certainly violation of U.S. law on that, as there has been violation of European laws and other laws in the world. The other thing is that I would get at here was, <clears throat> even though this was information warfare and it's, it's disinformation that the Russians have engaged in, this is a little bit beyond the norms of normal cyber intrusions and cyber espionage. 
we dealt with this with the Chinese too, where we've had to push back on their corporate espionage activities. We say you go to violate norms and go beyond the pale. Every country involved, you know, engages in normal espionage where they try to gather state secrets. So again, it wasn't just a violation of US laws, maybe not a violation of international law, but certainly a violation of the norms of countries in terms of how they conduct their diplomatic relations with one another. That's, I, I'd be interested in your reaction to that. Perfect and pointed uh, question there. Of course, I like the defense of the espionage, which is, of course, part <laughs> of normal activity. A gentleman there had a, a question. So I'm Jenil Narayanan from the USI. Uh, I look at it from a slightly different perspective. Cyber war is not a single entity of its own. Chinese call it the unrestricted warfare, and Frederick Engel calls what the Americans do, I'm sure the American friends here may not like it, full spectrum dominance, which covers military, transmilitary, and non-military domain. The question to be asked here, when you know about these activities is see or no? Who gains? Well, you may have a normal hacker who's just doing it for fun, but there are two main levels where countries are involved and where criminality is involved, like the funds which were hacked. But the worry we should look at is when countries are involved. And it becomes difficult to trace back because of the VPN. It's very difficult to trace back. So it is It is not just the information which is being taken out, but who is taking it out and for what. And what else are the other activities that it can generate? Like the example given was of Muzaffar Nagar. You could also go back to 2008, what happened when all the Northeast students ran away from Bangalore. It is these activities which add on to the cyber domain and the threat to the countries. And so I would agree with what Ambassador said here that it's not a cold war, but are we looking at a uh, era of cold peace, where nations keep doing these things for their own good, to Russians be dominant call it hot over peace. the others. Russians call it hot peace. Yeah. Um, and there was one gentleman before I get to, yeah, please go. I think I'm Anbu from EDIA, Economic Research Institute for ASEAN and East Asia. Actually, I like it that is how, how Trump really narrated, articulated, and this, uh, this cyber war is... Uh, it's a war to show the power, and, and uh, it is uh, for the state. I think there is, a, there is a clear winner. And if it is a commercial war, I think there is a profit is coming. And sometimes it is, a, uh, again, it is an individual hobby. That is what happened the WikiLeaks. But the question is, we have the clear winner, and, and, uh, but at the same time, we have the losers. So in this kind of uh, non-traditional war, how the losers can be compensated? What kind of mechanisms that is we can think about it? Yeah, so my point is limited, and it's both to um, Udbhav, uh, Ambassador Suri, and of course Arun, who uh, actually touched upon it. I think what all of you are basically trying to say is that there are a number of elements. The one that we are focusing on in this panel happens to be influence operations. I think so let's call it that. We are trying to basically speak about influence operations and the legality of influence operations in the cyber domain. Uh, now, uh, contrary to the uh, intervention made by uh, my friend from America, I, uh, I, I'm a little puzzled on um, uh, either the legality or the certainty of the legality of any case being made against Russia in America. So I think, first of all, we need to understand that. I don't know which law has been broken, but certainly it has not been proven to be broken. I think that's the first uh, 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 uncertainty on that particular charge, and I think that must be understood. Uh, therefore, the, to prosecute it, internationally becomes doubly difficult. And I think that's the point Arun was making, that it's not as if something wrong has not been done, but certainly something illegal is, 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 a little, is a little distance away. And I think that's the point Arun was trying to make. So influence operations and how illegal are influence operations, can we ever agree to that? So can a country like the United States say that I will not indulge in influence operations and change the governments in the Central European countries or in, uh, or in Russian satellite countries, the colored revolutions, for example. So I'm saying influence operations are age-old. The velocity and the rapidity 
and the use of this new domain unsettles us. It's not something new. So I think we must understand when we start talking about Cold War and information wars, what we are really talking about is that are we going to see countries uh, rein in their capacities or arrange their capacities to uh, influence political outcomes across the world? That's the question we are trying to ask here. And I, and I guess countries are doing that. Okay, um, we have uh, one comment and then we have, I think, uh, two comments and three questions. Uh, I think uh, Joseph has a direct question for you. Uh, the gentleman, uh, anyone who wants to take the answer to that, because I think it's very interesting that now you have all these cyber victims. You could talk about the perpetrators and say we don't have a way of policing them yet, but what about the cyber victims? Who's going to compensate them when that $170 million doesn't come back? Um, and we have, uh, and, and we had one more question on um, the gentleman over there who had uh, basically asked the question is, you know, shouldn't we just focus on when states get into this? And uh, that's when it becomes the most, uh, the most diabolical for the world in a sense. Um, yeah, I don't have anything further to add from what Samir said in response to the question on, I think we can agree that the US law is not international law yet. And therefore, <laughs> they, are, um, they are quite different. But, but more importantly, uh, I think, and, and you brought this out as well, the distinction between what the espionage... What happens when Chinese law becomes international? <laughs> the espionage operations that were conducted by China were clearly for commercial purposes, as a gentleman just said, as a result of which there was a binding agreement between Obama and Xi in 2015 as a result of which there was a clause introduced that there will not be any uh, espionage operations, comma, for a commercial purpose. Now that is something that is established because there is a loss of commercial, uh, there is a property um, infringement which is recognized in major jurisdictions as a violation of both domestic law and as well as international law. But what do you do when the information is uh, not being sold? So if I am right, the, the, uh, the law that is being violated in the United States for which the FBI has indicted the Russian hackers are for breaking and entering into computer networks. I'm sure the Russians have no problem giving them up uh, for such a small offense. So <laughs> in, in reality, the only, of, the only countermeasure that uh, the United States could do was to diplomatically respond, which the Obama administration did, by, by packing uh, all the Russian diplomats into a plane uh, and sending them back to Moscow where they were warmly welcomed by uh, Vladimir Putin. Right? And, and as, and, and where this argument of a country's domestic law being sacrosanct, even in the absence of an international law, be respected, then I feel that a lot of countries would jump in queue and say, look, I had a problem with uh, a platform that was located in the United States, which violated my domestic law, starting with Muzaffar Nagar, for instance. So, uh, you know, the only way, and I think as Swasni mentioned, you, you need to have an SOP and you need to have an international, a binding instrument. Um, Fortunately, the private companies based in the United States, starting with Microsoft, have realized that you need what they call a digital Geneva Convention. Unfortunately, the US government does not seem to have realized it. For, I mean, and the official US position on this is that um, the, a formal binding legal instrument to regulate cyber operations is premature because we do not know where the technology might lead us. Uh, technology right now is not leading us in any great direction. <laughs> Well, I'm glad, Samir, you brought uh, what you said out in the open. I mean, you called it influence operation. I would say that no state should pretend to be holier than thou. All states play this game, irrespective. So if you're hurt today, I'm afraid it's too bad, because you don't stop playing the game yourself. And in a lighter note, I've just come back from Moscow, and they're having a very big chuckle, honestly. I mean, they say that if we want to fix any politician in the West, all we have to do is, our, somebody from our embassy has to make a phone call to them. <laughs> which will get monitored, and that's the end of him. Yeah. Well, look, uh, if you're putting yourself in that situation, that's your choice. But I think uh, to pretend that only the Russians hack and, hack and nobody else hacks would be unfair. On the issue of compensation to losers, you're absolutely right. That's why I said courts have now begun to get into the act in different domestic jurisdictions. So you will have a situation where you know different courts will give different judgments. And a time will come that both domestically and internationally, you'd have to come to some kind of arrangement on how such losses will have to be compensated. That's why I said it's a long process. And I think, I personally believe that it's premature to jump into binding legal contracts. I agree with Arun that that is what may ultimately be the ideal. But you will not get the ideal for a long time. You will have suboptimal solutions, which will remain suboptimal because technology will keep changing. 
So you have to have a contract, a social contract. There will be have to domestic social contract, there will be an international social contract. Otherwise, you know, you will not progress because the technology is advancing at such a pace that uh, I don't think anybody can keep in touch with that, with that pace, with that rapidity. And the last point is about uh, the importance of corporations and citizens. I think, you know, it's not just corporations and citizens. It's also social society networks. I mean, today, who can't influence whom? It's a question of, uh, you know, some people have made a choice that they will not go on to Twitter, for instance. Right? Some people have made a choice they will not go on to Facebook. Now, question to ask is, are they winners or are they losers? The answer will depend on which side of the argument you're on. So this is, that's why, this is not, this is not, I won't call it warfare. I think we have yet to come to terms with how to use the technology that has now become available to us. And the challenge is to make sure it's used for the right purposes. You will always have misuse. I don't think you can ever have a situation where it will not be misused. So let's not <laughs> pretend that you can enter utopia on this. You will have to find your way you know, by in fits and starts and hope that you come to a, a reasonably optimal solution in how you handle the misuse of information technology and digital networks. So uh, while I think all the main questions that have been answered by everyone, uh, like that have been asked by everyone have been answered by the rest of the esteemed panel, there's one small point that I would like to make. Um, traditional notions of superiority, resources, ability to wage war, if that's what we're calling it now, or anything else, simply don't apply to cyberspace, right? I mean, let's look at the sort of countries that have carried out the attacks that we all used as examples in the last one hour, right? North Korea and Iran, rank nowhere in like say even the top 50 militaries or these or, or any other met metric by which you would gauge the capability of a state to wage war with others but these are in, but these entities are causing damages to the tune of billions of dollars and causing nation states to change their course of actions for some of the most for some of their most integral matters of functioning by the simple acts that are carried out by a few hundred people who are in front of desktops, right? So I mean, if this is a war or even if this, not is, uh, if this is not a war, there is no more a traditional front line where a war will be taking place which can be regulated to which rules can apply. This is about people sitting on their phones and computers anywhere in the globe carrying out an attack anywhere else in the globe. And to understand that as a paradigm and to react to that paradigm either in the form of international law or in the form of non-building consensus or any other form of regulation, which, ha let's be clear about this, just because it's taking time or it hasn't happened so far does not mean it cannot happen. If it does not happen, I mean, yeah, then we're all going to, like, we're going to become an anarchical society and there's going to be a Skynet and we're all going to get blown to hell, right? Fine. I mean, you either accept that or you accept the fact that there is going to be a form of regulation that has to take place. Whether enough wrong has not happened yet to jerk nation states into action to creating that regulation is another matter but it has to happen but a the fact that it has to happen and b the fact that traditional notions of believing who is spying on me and who cannot spy on me or who can wage or cannot wage a war to me simply don't apply anymore yeah uh, i want to analyze the the russian behavior on the cyberspace with the the, the tool of uh, real politik it was a marvelous operation i mean uh, of course they didn't force the Americans to vote for Donald Trump or the British to, for, to vote for Brexit, but they, they scrambled. And that was a successful operation because now we have, uh, anyway, whatever Donald Trump does, we have uh, the, an America, a destabilized America, a destabilized administration, a destabilized NATO, a destabilized European Union, that, by the way, they voted for sanction against Russia. So it's a, it's a wonderful operation, but, if this is the reality of the world today, and if we are going to, or already we are on a multipolar world, and the multipolar world history tell us, tells us that multipolar, a multipolar world is, is a prescri prescription for wars. Remember the First and the Second World War. So we have to make, especially now with, the, with this strange weapon of cyber that can be so easily used by anyone, especially, again, expertise is Russia, but anyone can use it, and also the Americans are using, not on uh, uh, not that way, not respecting the international norm, which are even outside the real politics they're using. But anyway, <laughs> since we have also, we have a, a multiple <coughs> war plus with this uh, weapon of mass, a potential weapon of mass destruction, which is uh, cyber, we have to work 
it's much, it's much absolutely necessary today to work for, to, to build up a new system of, co of collective security, a new, call it as, as you like, call it uh, Vienna <laughs> a conference, call it a yeah, new Yalta, but we need now, even more than before, just to avoid other tragedies like First and Second War, we need to build up a, 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 a system of collective security. A perfect note to end on. Thanks so much that the need for the rule of law, of course, we're still trying to find international rule of law in so many other spheres, but uh, a rule of law uh, understanding between uh, the, uh, the Committee of Nations, really, uh, is, is the need of the day. And as Udva pointed out, just because something hasn't happened yet doesn't mean it has it can't happen you know in uh, october 2016 when india announced it had conducted surgical strikes across the loc uh, there was an uh, amazing moment there where an entire nation on the basis of uh, what the government was saying but also amplified by the media amplified by the twitter believed that the surgical strikes had happened. There was an entire nation across the line of control mm. that on the basis of what they heard and what they read and what they were seeing, believed the exact opposite. Imagine that in a world like today, it is possible for two nations abutting each other to believe completely different things. I shudder to think what would have happened if both nations actually had believed that there had been a strike at that moment and what that would have led to. Um, but these scenarios of wagging the dog uh, have now been moved from the states uh, to powerful organizations, influential organizations like the mainstream media, uh, to perhaps to social media, and now to, as Udbhav said, uh, to maybe one or two people working with just a cell phone. Uh, on that note, we're going to wrap up this session. I'm sure you'll have lots of questions you can uh, take to the coffee, but thanks so much for being such a great audience. <laughs>